Hey soccer fans, this is Nick reminding you to check out Sports Spider. If you're tired of searching multiple websites for sports news, SportsSpider.com has you covered. They collect the latest articles, videos, and podcasts from around the web and organize them by your favorite teams. If you want to stay as updated as possible on the Chicago Fire or any other team, hit the link in the description to check out SportsSpider.com. Hey soccer fans, welcome to the Feed the Fire podcast. I'm your host Nick and today we are again talking about the Chicago Fire and Major League Soccer. This week I have titled this episode, It's the Same Thing Every Week. Not only was that the phrase I heard screamed by the most obnoxious group of teenage fans sitting in front of me at the game, among some of their other more explicit criticisms that they offered, but it is stating the facts that we are witnessing the same thing every week by the Chicago Fire. So as, as crude as those kids were and as little as I wanted my kindergartner near them during the match, they weren't wrong in their criticism of the Fire. It is the same thing every week, and we are going to look at that loss versus DC United. We're going to look at the stats, we're going to look at some of the big plays, and then we'll share some stories from the match as well, and then kind of look at a few things from around the league and around U.S. soccer. As a reminder, you can find me on social media at Glasshouse Soccer, or you can email me, glasshousesoccer at gmail.com, just like our good friend of the show Israel did. And Israel, I, I sent you a reply to a lot of your comments, but one thing I wanted to share with everyone on the show here, and this was also something that I was uh, engaging people with in on Twitter, uh, he, Israel asks, what do you think is going to happen to Coach Klopas? Do you think they would keep him next year, but on a front office role? Now, personally, I would love to see Frank move into a team ambassador role. We've seen this with the Bulls. We've seen it with other sports teams around the country. I think it would be great for Frank to kind of help fix some of his image here with the Chicago Fire. Everyone loved him as a player. Everyone loved him that first coaching stint, even though it wasn't very successful. People liked hearing him in the booth for the most part. I think they liked more of his stories than his actual speaking in commentary. Uh, but at this point, nobody likes Frank Lopas. Nobody likes him as a head coach. Nobody likes to hear him talk post-game, midweek, because it's just the same old kind of coach speak we get from him each and every week. And he's not doing anything different week to week, and the results aren't any different week to week. So I think to kind of save his face for Chicago Fire fans, new fans and old fans, to kind of just give him his sanity back and kind of give him some room to breathe and actually enjoy being part of the Chicago Fire organization, I think an ambassador role for him would be fantastic. I think he would slip into that role very easily. He's very friendly. Like He always tries to come out with a smile and have a little personal conversation, connect with fans, media, anyone, whoever it may be. So when he has no coaching responsibilities, no front office decision-making responsibilities. When he's not in charge of anything except showing up and having fun, it would do wonders for his own mental health, I think, as well as for him just to have some good memories of the Chicago Fire at the end of his career. And also, if you get Frank Klopas to be an ambassador or to hang out at games as like a special guest, you could use that to maybe try to get some of those old fans back, some of the OG original fans back into the Chicago Fire fold because a lot of people are complaining they have been alienated or forgotten or this team is terrible, it's not worth my time after 20 years plus of supporting them. So Frank could be a way to bring that back. I would love to see Klobos as that ambassador, uh, ambassador kind of fun fan facing role kind of person. However, we know that Frank will do whatever the club asks of him, and we know the club can always count on Frank to do that. So if there is ever a position for him within the front office that needs to get filled, it wouldn't surprise me if he is at the top of their list or among the top three or four candidates for a position. I'm not saying he's going to be our next sporting director. I'm not saying he's going to take over for George Heiss or Sebastian Pelzer whenever he leaves, and I don't want that. Frank does not have that skill set about him. So 
All that being said, that's where I think it goes, Israel. If you got other thoughts, let me know what you would like to see. And fans out there, you know, comment on the YouTube video or shoot me a message on social media at Glasshouse Soccer. Uh, or hey, if you want to post post the clip of my show on Reddit and kind of get the conversation going. I'm not going to be the one to toot my own horn on on that page, but if you want to clip it and put it out there and get a conversation going, I'd be I'd love to see it. Now, another email I got this week was from our friend Ryan uh, with another great transition into the analysis of our main topic here, the DC United game. Ryan says, with the loss to DC, while not mathematically out of the playoffs, mathematically, mathematically out of the playoffs, they are not going to make it. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with that one, <laughs> Ryan. It would be nice if the team would have played a complete match. In fact, I would say most of their season, they have failed to play a full 90. Right now, I'm just looking forward to the offseason where the team can give me a false sense of hope again. Wow, Ryan, I can't disagree with you, man. You're absolutely right. This fire team has not played a full 90 most, if not all, matches this year. They have failed to play a complete game. They are either scrambling uh, for a comeback. They either collapse or just kind of become lackadaisical if they get off to a good start. And we'll talk about some of Frank Lopez's post-game comments about the importance of having a fast start and then maintaining control of the game. Something, again, we've been hearing every single week, and yet the team continues to fail to do it. And just your last sentence there, Ryan, that just hits me hard because when you say, I'm looking forward to the offseason where they can give me false hope again, man, we are, we have been so beaten down and battered by this club. And I'd like to say like, Hey, at least it's, it's bear season. Let's go find a look. We can just find some more false hope over there. <laughs> oh, I don't think there's any real hope yet uh, coming in for the bears season though. What, what a nice comeback by the defense this weekend. That was a welcome sight to see. But as we segue into our DC United recap, it, it is exactly that. We saw the Chicago Fire come out flat. We saw DC United get two early goals, five minutes apart, not even. Benteke scores in the 26th minute. Pirani scores in the 29th minute. And these were not spectacular plays. This was not Benteke going up and dunking on our defenders. This was not Pirani dribbling through three players or weaving his way through the defense and receiving a pinpoint pass. These were just meh, kind of average to below average MLS quality goals. That's the problem with the fire. They give up the bangers, and every team is going to give up a banger. Shoot, DC gave one up to Andrew Goodman in the 54th minute. By the way, Goodman, Goodman uh, having, I think I saw it was like his 100th appearance uh, as, a, as a fire player, and whether academy and senior team or something like that, gets his first goal for the club. So a memorable night for him, that's for sure. And he looked the part tonight. He was one of the few guys that came ready and continued to play uh, with a lot of enthusiasm and vigor and aggressiveness throughout his time in the match. Uh, but yeah, it, this this was the defense becoming so lackadaisical and lazy. This was the offense not being able to come out with a little of that fire to keep the game on the front foot where DC United can't have any sort of possession or any sort of rhythm or get any sort of opportunities. And if if you want to talk about DC United's possession, uh, they had the majority of the possession in the first half, but, but not by much. When the fire had the ball, they had the ball for stretches of time. That's for sure. And you can go look at the breakdown on MLSsoccer.com on the stats there. So it wasn't like DC dominated this game. It was the fire, though, just coming out lazy enough and not really asserting themselves. That leads to the Benteke goal. That leads to the Piranha goal. And again, how are you giving up goals within three minutes of each other is also something. And, you know, I hate to reiterate these kind of points, but I'll agree with what Frank said uh, some weeks back, paraphrasing here, like, take some pride in it. Like, these guys are coming, they score on you and they're coming at you again. Take some pride in your game, step your game up and play. Now, there's a lot more that goes into it when tactically you're at a disadvantage because your coach doesn't know how to line you up. You've got some players out on international duty, some players banged up like Mauricio Pineda. Uh, so you're already at these disadvantages. You can make up for it with that aggressiveness, with that mindset to a certain extent. But when you don't have, say, an outlet pass, 
from your defense. Or when your midfielder is constantly turning the ball over, that takes a mental toll. And you saw the mental toll on the Chicago Fire defense already by the time that first goal was scored. Now, what am I talking about that mental toll? The it, it, Think of it, since we're back in Bears season now, think of it in NFL terms. Imagine if your offense is going three and out every drive and the defense is on the field for, you know, 45 minutes of, of, of a game. They're going to get exhausted. There's going to be breakdowns mentally, physically, matchup-wise. Those things are going to happen. And in this case, for the entire first half, the only thing the fire did offensively was if the ball was in the middle of the field, try to get it to Gutierrez and see if he can make something happen, which DC snuffed out pretty quickly. They would collapse two guys on them, and Gutierrez would either have to pass back or turn the ball over. If they weren't in the middle of the field and they were on the outside in their, their defensive third or even their middle third, it was send a long ball to Haile Selassie and then maybe he can get across into Kuypers to create an opportunity. There were so many balls that were played over the top by Chicago Fire defenders, it was it was laughable. You know, and I was sitting in, in Seat Geek in section 126, so about even with you know maybe the the top of the box that that the fire were attacking and there was so very little action you know my kids are like are we gonna see anything down here on this end of the field and then when they flipped at halftime and it's like okay great maybe we'll see the fire trying to assert themselves and we'll see some action or i'm sorry uh the fire are gonna try to assert themselves and all the action is gonna go the other way so it was really kind of disappointing just just to have my boys be like i'm bored and yeah they're eight and five but still like there's nothing going on in the fires offensive third of the field and i i go on mls statistics and analysis uh on twitter i retweeted it out after the game or, or on sunday afternoon sometime and yeah just look at the passing chart look at those breakdowns there, there's the fire aren't threatening at all there's no consistent play in the attacking third and no good counterattacks. And, and we'll leave it at that. So the defense, as a result, has been asked to do a lot more for a longer part of the game, and breakdowns are going to happen. I didn't expect them to happen so soon and three minutes apart, though. All right, one of the other observations that I wanted to point out, especially sitting in the 12th row near the fire bench, Frank Klopas this game was a statue. He had no animation, he had no spirit, he had no gesticulations, did not pull out the whiteboard from what I saw, uh, barely interacted with the players on the bench or the coaches behind him. E even one of the assistant coaches w had to be yelling at the fourth official for the timekeeping or yelling at the AR, uh, why is DC moving the ball up on every throw and why are they taking their time? What What's going on here? You know, why, why are the players for DC who are down injured for over a minute, why, why are they not being taken off the field? I thought if you were down for 15 seconds, you have to leave the field for a minute. Someone please write to me and tell me where I'm misinterpreting these rules. Because either the head ref, Foti Bazakos, forgot about it and wasn't enforcing it, or he was saying that there was some exception to that for whatever reason. I don't know. But that was another thing. DC was absolutely taking advantage of the fact that they could be down on the pitch for a minute plus and not have to leave the field uh, for the required minute. Uh, again, maybe I'm misinterpreting the rules. Maybe that's not how it's supposed to be going just yet in MLS, but I thought I've seen it in games before. I don't know why I didn't see it in this one. All right, what else did we need to go over? Let's get into, since we're, ta since we're talking about Frank here, uh, and how he was a statue and just not into this match at all. Let's go over some of his post-game comments and see if we can glean anything from that. Now, these post-game comments were as reported by Joe Chats over at ONTAP Sportsnet. And if you're not following Joe Chats and if you're not reading his work, you need to be doing that. Great coverage on the Chicago Fire. Uh, a great writer and, and a good guy. I've gotten to see him out at a few different tailgates and events. So definitely someone uh, where you can get some really, really great firsthand Chicago Fire reporting. So here we go. Here is Frank Klopas post game. 
Quote, falling behind with the two goals, one of the things that we addressed is making it really difficult for Benteke in the game. I think the cross comes in, we could do better, obviously, to deny it. Everything starts from there. Get pressure before the cross comes. And just unfortunate, I think the first one with Carlos, because he just doesn't time it well enough, he jumps and it falls on Benteke, and it's unfortunate. See, I hate when people are like, ah, unlucky, you know, and you hear it in the game all the time. Oh, unlucky, that's unfortunate, just didn't get the bounce. Well, when you're playing like trash, when you don't work on certain game situations in training, when you're one-on-one -on -one training, when your individual workouts, when your group, small groups and, and full team trainings aren't working on these things, you're not going to get these bounces. When you don't have coaches or even just veteran players to help develop a Carlos Tehran who could make it in a top five league in Europe. He's got the physical attributes. There's no doubt about that. He's got the passion and the desire, but no one is coaching him up and helping him work on his game as an individual and as part of a defensive unit. So that's why these bounces aren't going their way. There's no communication. There's no cohesiveness. So that you can't just say, well, unlucky, unfortunate bounce. You know, it's he, he, he didn't time his jump right. Well, what are you guys working on in training? And when you're playing against Christian Benteke, who has is the best aerial duelist in MLS, and that's by the numbers, he has won more aerial duels by far than any other player in this league, at least by 50-some if I remember reading it right. Why aren't you working on those situations in practice? We said it on the podcast last week. If you're going to beat DC, you bracket Tehran, or you shut down Cleek who is the one who's driving the offense. That's it. You take one of those two guys away from DC, they have nothing. We looked at the stats last week. Benteke has now 18 goals for DC United. The rest of the team has 12, maybe? 15? I, I forget exactly how many they've had. But it's it's probably around 15 goals as a team. Cleek has what, like six or seven? I'm, I'm, I didn't. I wrote over my old notes. I can't remember it. Assists or so. He's got like six to nine assists. Nobody else on the team is more than two. So you take one of those guys away, you shut down DC's offense, and the fire couldn't take one of those guys away. So I don't want to hear Frank that it's just unlucky or unfortunate or we can do better. No, no, duh, you can do better. But what are you doing to do better? It's not there. All right, Frank, that, wow, that was a rant. I didn't have any of that in my show notes. That was just off the cuff, guys. That was a little something straight out of my litigation background. Okay, so Frank continues his post-game comments. The next one, I think it's both two goals. Okay, that's, yep, I'm reading it correctly. I think it's both two goals that were soft goals, personally, because I think we should have done better. And then we came in at the half and we had to push the game, obviously. Alan had a little bit with his ankle, but I wanted to bring another forward in. And we talked about just making sure that, you know, we're in the game as long as we make the next play, the next goal. And yeah, that's fine. You're still in the game. That's true. And Goodman gives you that hope. But again, there was really nothing that the fire were doing differently that second half. Yeah, you bring in Barlow and you get a lot more high pressing, a lot more high energy out of him. But what is he going to do with the ball? We know Barlow can't score. We know his distribution is not the greatest. So he's going to cause a turnover on the defensive back line for DC, assuming he can cause a turnover there. But what is he going to do with it, right? If you're playing with that dual striker, it's, yeah, in part, you're looking to feed each other, but more so you're looking for Barlow to pull defenders out of position, giving Kuiper space or a one-on-one -on -one matchup to exploit, not for Barlow to be assisting him. That's at least not the primary way of playing a two-striker system as I understand it. Yeah, it's a way to do it, but not the primary reason, right? So the fact that Barlow's out there trying to create turnovers, yeah, that's fine late in the game, but who else is doing it? There's no one, no one in the midfield stepped up this game. And we saw Jimenez and Acosta. Jimenez was trying. He actually looked pretty good. He put in a good effort, but there's nothing that he does that advances the play forward. So again, even with the substitutions and the fresh legs, there's no new ideas coming into the pitch. And that is just, as we say it, every week, it's the same thing. And speaking of that, here's Klobus's last post-game comment that I'm going to read. We needed to come out with energy. If we did that, I felt that we were in the game. 
If I had a nickel, folks, if I had a nickel. We got that goal, and then if you see the second half, the amount of possession, and it's a team that was sitting back looking to counter. We get in good spots, and then our ability in the final 25 yards from goal, whether it's just making a play, the quality of the crosses coming in, connecting, we get in really good spots, and we need to be better and sharper in the final third in those areas. Okay, let's let's try and fact check Frank Klopas on that one. Um, you know, we, we had the possession in the second half. Uh, yeah, they sure did. If you look on MLSsoccer.com, the five-minute increments of possession for the second half, the Chicago Fire had seven of them. One was even. Uh, actually, the Chicago Fire had the majority of possession in eight of the five-minute increments, and on one of them, it was even. The Fire had the possession, but what did they do with it? Their XG was 0.6. They had six shots and two shots on target. I think I saw something that said their first shot didn't come until the 40th minute. So that was just, again, Frank, you want to come out with high energy and starting fast and doing all these great things, but your players don't know what to do with it. Similarly, we see them trying to play the ball out of the back. Playing the ball out of the back means nothing Maintaining that possession means nothing if you don't know what you're going to do with it or if the only thing you're going to do with it is try and play it long or give it to Guti to try and dribble around a bit. Uh, here is now Captain Gaston Jimenez's post-game quotes also uh, from Joe Chats. Uh, we are frustrated with the result and with the position we find ourselves in now. It's not what we want, it's not what we wanted, and it's not what we trained for. I, I find that difficult to believe that you're training for anything, Gaston. And you're the captain, man. Come on, own some of this. Uh, this was a difficult game with two very different halves. and one half, we dominated, and the other half, we didn't. Honestly, can you say you dominated? Yes, you dominated possession, but you did not dominate the second half. You did not dominate the game. Because DC gave you possession, knowing you can't do anything with it. And definitely not going to score two goals in the second half with it. Uh, Gaston continues... It was difficult, but as, I, but as I tell the guys, we have to continue fighting. I tell them we can't give up, and that's just what you have to do in the game, in life. It's part of life. It's part of sports, and we just have to keep going forward. That's what we need to do. Re really good coach speak there from Gaston Jimenez. Um, and, oh, Joe clarified in his article, a point I was trying to make before, uh, Andrew Gutman was thrilled to make his 100th MLS start. So it didn't have anything to do with specifically playing for the fire or anything, but his 100th MLS start and gets, gets a goal on that night. Um, let's see if there was anything he says about this game. We gave up two soft goals. We dug ourselves a hole. Obviously, we came out a lot better in the second half. We controlled the game, pushed the tempo. I was able to get us back in by one goal, but we're lacking that final ball in the final third to create the goal. I think what we saw in the second half, I think we put in a good performance. To me, being at home, we should win every single game, so that's disappointing. So I'm glad he said that. I'm glad he set a standard there. Like, I'm going to hearken back to my corporate management days when I had to do performance reviews for my team. And if anyone has done these, uh, either as a manager or as an employee, you're all familiar with the concept of SMART goals, right? They have to be specific, measurable, achievable uh, reasonable and, and timely and time limited. I, I think that's what the acronym stands for, but essentially you have to have some way to quantify your goals. So when you hear Klopas talk, he says, we, we got to do better. We had some unfortunate bounces. We got to do better. Okay. There's no accountability there. There's no measurability there. There's nothing specific. How do you, how do you just be better, right? There's nothing you can specifically do, uh, to that. Gaston Jimenez says, you just got to keep fighting. You just got to keep fighting. Okay. How, how do you want me to fight? What do you want me to do when I get the ball? What do you want me to do on defensively? How are we going to, how are we going to do this? You can't just go out and run your team out there. I even know that with my under nine team, like I have worked drills with them and I was so happy that the program directions I got from our league had us working on a wall pass. And wouldn't you know it, the one kid who thinks he's playing in the Premier League each and every weekend, him and his best friend on the team, probably two of our most talented players, they actually did the wall pass. They dropped back from their attacking position into the midfield, did a couple wall passes, just boom, boom, 
to draw on the other team, and then they took the ball the other direction. I'm like, oh my goodness, my nine-year-olds are are doing a skill that yeah, Manchester City's doing, even though they're doing it to the nth degree. My nine-year, my under nines are doing wall passes and pulling the other team out of position. Why can't the Chicago Fire do it? Like I said, no smart goals. They're just trying to be better. But now we hear Andrew Goodman say, we need to win our home games. He is giving a measuring stick. He is saying this is one way to measure our performance that's not just win, losses, effort, and meaningless possession. And so I'm going to give a little credit there. It's not the best measuring stick, and it's not the best thing perhaps measurable to evaluate this team, but at least he's trying to have some sort of goal and accountability and say, we need to win home games. End of story. We need to come out and play better at home with better tactics, better attacking tactics. He even said, we need to figure out how to play that final ball. So that is uh, the the post-game comments from Klopas and a couple of the players there. Uh, should we even go over the lineups here, everybody? Should we? Yeah, we'll, we might as well as, as we do every week here. Uh, the MLSsoccer.com website had the fire in a 4-4-2. Uh, Brady and Net, Goodman, Amsberg, Tehran, and Suke were your backline starters. Gutierrez, Jimenez, Acosta, and Aragoni were your midfield line, but obviously you saw Jimenez and Acosta dropping deeper, Gutierrez coming in centrally. So you line up in this position, uh, and this is a defense, if this is your defensive shape, you're essentially sacrificing the entire left side of your formation because Gutierrez doesn't play defense. Goodman is supposed to, Goodman's a decent defender, but he's supposed to be pushing up and going forward. So you have Jimenez and Acosta dropping back in a defensive role, and yet you're trying to play long balls to Selassie. Like, nothing makes sense. Nothing makes sense for this. The fire were just asking to be scored on, and if this was a team, I don't know, say the Red Bulls that we're going to see this weekend, it, this could have been like a 4 nothing match uh, in, in favor of the opposing team. Now, we did see some subs. Herbers comes in for Goodman. Uh, Justin Reynolds comes in uh, for Kellen Acosta. Shout out Justin Reynolds. My son was hanging over the tunnel as the players were exiting. Got a high five from Justin Reynolds. One of the highlights of his nights at the game. Uh, we did see Jonathan Dean get in for Anosuke. Tom Barlow subs in for Argoni to try and give that offensive threat. Uh, but nothing doing there. So that is uh, the Chicago Fire lineup. Uh, let's do the stats in the second half of the show. Let's take our water break here, and we are going to recognize our sponsor, Skira Icelandic Spring Water. Icelandic for clear, Skira water comes from a spring in a government-protected nature preserve in Iceland with a naturally low mineral content. This isn't your average water. Clearly, pun intended, it's one of the best. Skira Icelandic Spring Water is available at your local 7-Eleven, and even though the weather's cooling, you still got to stay hydrated. Go out, get a couple bottles or so of Skira, and by the way, that cool weather, it's going to flip starting next week. We'll be back up in the 90s, folks, if not already sometime soon, so make sure you've got a couple bottles of Skira lying around the house, at your office, you know, in your gym locker, so that way you can stay hydrated in this weather. And again, thank you to Skira for always supporting the Feed the Fire podcast. All right, let, let's let now take a look at the statistics here of this matchup against DC, and then we can put this one to bed and move on to a few other things. Uh, the Chicago Fire, as we mentioned, did control the possession in this game about 60-40, 60% to DC's 40%. Uh, six shots by the fire, nine by DC, two on goal by the fire, three by DC. So not a lot of offense in this game on either side of the pitch, but it was DC that converted against some lazy fire defending. The fire defense was credited with one block shot. Here's the crazy thing. This may have been the Chicago Fire's best statistical passing game of the season. I didn't go back and look at every match, but I don't remember the fire ever having 636 passes and completing them at an 86.5% clip. That is insane numbers. That's Barcelona numbers. 
However, what are the fire doing with it? Nothing. And where are a lot of those passes coming from? Their own half of the field. There you go. Um, I wish that they that, that that the website would give a little bit more details, like they used to, into uh, where the passes occurred. If it was you know defensive third, defensive half, um, but that's that's what it is. The one thing to note, though, of their passing set piece cross percentage, the fire had zero. Uh, their open play crossing percentage twenty five. So terrible on free kicks, terrible on crossing. And yet we have a free kick coach on the roster, on the payroll. Uh, the fire ended up with three corners, eight total crosses. They won 12 aerial duels to DC's 12. Again, expected goals in this match, 1.4. And that's for both teams. The fire were only at a 0.6 XG and DC was at a 0.8. Uh, both keepers were credited with one save. Nice to see Alex Bono. Good to see him again. I'm trying to relive his glory days from Toronto there. Uh, the defense for the fire credited with six clearances. The fire committed 10 fouls, received one yellow card, no red cards. Thankfully, we didn't see Fetty Navarro out there running around like a madman. Otherwise, there probably would have been at least one more yellow, if not a red card. Uh, he was available off the bench, did not make it into the game. All right, that is our recap of Chicago Fire hosting and losing to DC United 2-1 this weekend at SeatGeek in Bridgeview. So some final thoughts here. Where does this leave the Chicago Fire? Well, they're pretty much out of the playoff race. They're not mathematically eliminated, but by all intents, for all intents and purposes, they are out of the race. Their next match is against Red Bulls, who's a top team in the East Conference this season. Uh, the Fire are now on 28 points. They are one point above Nashville. I'm sorry. The Chicago Fire are on 26 points. I was looking at games played. The Fire are on 26 points, tied for worst in the East with Nashville, and Nashville's got a game in hand. Uh, so the, that game in hand, the Fire ended up losing. So as long as Nashville gets a draw, they'll knock Chicago to the bottom of the Eastern Conference. Uh, Chicago is now six points from DC United in the ninth spot. Obviously, with that win, DC moves up. Toronto FC is in that eighth spot on 33 points. But ahead of the fire, Montreal, New England, Philly, and Atlanta. I don't think they are going to be able to make up six points in the next, was it, six, maybe seven games? Uh, so the fire are all but out of the playoffs. And it's time to move on to some roster evaluation. Let's start seeing uh, some different formations. Let's start seeing the end of the bench. Uh, play some significant minutes, 30, 40 minutes uh, in these matches. And heck, if you've got some guys on CF2, sign them to those four-day contracts and see what they can do uh, training with and playing against some first-team competition. I did want to share some stories. I'm, I don't want to end it on all doom and gloom, terrible. We, we know how bad the fire in their season are going. So I want to end with some, some fun stuff. Uh, so over the summer... Uh, my middle son, Teddy, who's been on uh, a couple episodes here and there, he got to participate in one of the Chicago Fire community camps. Uh, just, you know, it's just soccer summer camp. That's all it is. It's run by the Chicago Fire. So a little more expensive than I would have liked it to be for the instruction that they were getting because it was really just a summer camp. That was it. And about half the kids knew what they were doing. About half the kids didn't know what they were doing. So the coach had to kind of split his time and split the groups up. So I will say my one criticism of the Chicago Fire camps is the fact that you're paying a lot for a very basic summer camp. I don't know if my son improved his game, but he did get to play against other kids, which helped. Uh, but where you kind of get your money's worth of some of the extras and things. You get the t-shirt, you get a free ticket to a game, and he got to get in line for a couple player autographs. And tonight it was Mauricio Pineda and Jeff Gull really cool to see my son kind of interact with them. He's still kind of starstruck when he gets up close to some of these players just to see how big they are and physically fit they are compared to when he's watching them on TV or, you know, in the second de second level of Soldier Field. So it was really cool. He got to uh, have Jeff Gall and Mauricio Pineda sign his camp card. They had a little autograph section on the back of it. But also we've kept the giveaway from two 
seasons ago now. It was the deck of cards uh, that had all the different players and coach, uh, and, and Ezra Hendrickson as different card values. So you had Ezra was your ace, Shakiri was the king, uh, you had Brady as a queen, I want to say, or, or maybe further down, but like that's how it was, right? So he, we found the Mauricio Pineda card and had him autograph it, and that'll go nicely next to our Chris Brady and Brian Gutierrez playing card autographs as well. So that was fun. The other cool moment, and, and we've got to give some love to the referee when it's due. I don't think center ref Foti Bozakos had the best game. I think there were a couple calls that went against DC that should have been, or went in favor of DC that should have been no calls. I think he should have taken a look at a potential penalty for the Chicago Fire late in the game, but maybe VAR didn't make that call and he, he didn't want to overturn or stop things on the field for it. Um, but all in all, the fight, the refereeing didn't affect the outcome of this game. That was done by the Chicago Fire's play. Uh, but I will say, and, and I put it out on Twitter, if you're in the Greek community, I mean, you hear about six degrees of separation. If you're in the Greek community, it's two. And I had one of my best friends, uh, my son's godfather, he brought his family to the game. And so we're talking during the week and he goes, hey, by the way, I mentioned it to George, who's, who's also a friend of mine, that we're going to the game. George knows the referee, and apparently they're going to do something for us. I was like, "What? You're like I've I've never paid attention to referees, but now there's a Greek guy who I'm two degrees separated from, and now I have I have to figure this out. What's going on here? So as we're in our seats, about ten or fifteen minutes before kickoff, there's a gentleman in a pro referee's uh, warm up jacket who's walking around our section. And finally, goes, "Is there a Teddy around here?" And I go, "Yeah, it's my son." And he goes, here, I'm the liaison for the Chicago Fire uh, and pro referees. And this is something from head ref Foti Bizakos. And it was an autographed red card he gave to my son and an autographed yellow card he gave to uh, my friend's son while we were there. So really cool moment uh, for them. And my son's first red card. <laughs> so I guess we'll take it. But yeah, it was a neat moment. And, and it's cool to see that the referees can even get involved in some of that goodwill and outreach. Uh, speaking of that sort of thing, we stayed late so my son could kind of high-five some of the players, try to grab a jersey if he could. Uh, like I said, he got a high-five from Justin Reynolds. That was really cool. And as my son is down there screaming at the players and all the dozens of other kids are yelling at the players at the players, I see Director of Communications Rudy Hodgson over there and I yell to him, Rudy! And he turns around like, who in the world is possibly calling me at this moment when all the players are leaving and everyone's excited for them? Who's calling me? And he sees me and I wave. And we've had a number of conversations either on the, the South Concourse at Soldier Field or over social media. So, Rudy, it was great to see you, man. I hope you enjoyed the match despite the result. And looking forward to, to catching up more properly the next time I see you, my friend. Uh, and our fin last final feel-good story, I, I saw some pictures online that before the game, Dave Baldwin was walking around handing out t-shirts and scarves to fans. They had a $20 table uh, souvenir table set up or swag table set up. You could go and just, for 20 bucks, get like t-shirts from last season and trying to clear out some old stock. I wish I would have come across that table. So for the next few games, fans, keep a lookout for the $20 table, $20 soccer gear table there at the Fire Games. But Dave Baldwin was walking around, giving t-shirts, giving scarves. After the match, like I said, we stayed late. Dave was up in his little... Uh, in his seats above the fire bench, like second level. And, you know, I just kind of gave him a little bit of wave, gave him a little clap, like, thanks for a good night, appreciate what you're doing. He comes all the way down to the front of his section, reaches over to shake my hand, says hi to my boys. And I'm like, all right, boys, say thank you to Mr. Dave. He, he's in charge of, of, you know, helping helping us have a good time here. I'm trying to put it in their terms. They don't know who director, uh, you know, president of business operations. They don't know what that means. And, and thank you to Dave Baldwin, um, says, hey boys, I'm really glad you had fun. Here, looks like you guys could use a scarf. And he takes his Chicago Fire scarf that he was wearing during the game and hands it to my younger son. And it was just, a, it was a memory for him. And that's something he's going to stick with and keep every time he puts that scarf on. So, uh, yeah, the Fire are just awful when they're on the pitch trying to play a game and win. 
But I will say that all the extras and the little stuff they're doing in the community and for the fans in the stands, uh, it, I, I'm really appreciating it. And I think you, as, I think we as fans, we should demand it. We should expect it. We should be able to have these things. And we just got to take advantage of it and then recognize it when we do and when it's there. So that's what I wanted to make sure I did. Now, looking at one other, since we're kind of running long here tonight and it's really late and recording late this this Monday night, had to stay up and watch some Monday night football with a few of the neighborhood dads. Uh, just a couple things to note. Uh, NYCFC is getting a rebrand. Well, not necessarily rebrand. They're updating their logo. They're cleaning it up a little bit. I think it looks a little nicer. It's a little more bold. It stands out. Uh, it's more in line with, uh, you know, their sister club over in Manchester, England. Uh, so I think it's it's a nice little re, uh, nice little logo update uh, that NYCFC has been. You know, I tried going on to some of their social media pages to kind of see what the fan reaction was, but y you couldn't find any behind all of the "Do you still play in a baseball stadium?" Ho ho ho! Kind of a kind of a joke, and I've made that joke plenty of times. But uh, come on, guys, it's it's getting old. Let's let's make that joke when they actually are back in Yankee Stadium instead of City Field, too. All right, anyway. Um, the other headline, not MLS-related, but USMNT-related, and not good either. USMNT on Saturday played Canada in a friendly as they look to get ready for uh, World Cup qualifiers and the World Cup in 2026. Again, they've already qualified. They're one of the host nations, but still they get to kind of go through some of the process and play some games. Uh, USMNT loses to Canada 2-1. to one. They go down 2 nothing before they get the consolation goal there. This is the first time that Canada has beaten the United States in the U.S. since 1957. Did, did I say that right? Since 1957? Or in 57? I think it's since 1957. I gotta fact check myself. Yes, I almost said in 57 years. Canada has beaten the U.S. in America for the first time since 1957. That is kind of depressing. Uh, and it just shows you that Pochettino, hurry up and announce him so he can start working on this squad. They need it. I mean, honestly, the U.S. MNT might be the one squad that gives the Chicago Fire a run for their money for just the complete lack of offensive identity here. Maybe they'll find it against uh, a much worse opponent in New Zealand. Uh, they play Tuesday, September 10th at 6 p.m. So make sure you guys go check that game out and and see, hey, maybe if the U.S. keeps playing so poorly, some of these players will end up back in MLS and in Chicago, and maybe that can raise the profile of the club just a little bit. Maybe raise the talent level just a little bit as well. All right, with that, soccer fans, I want to thank you all for tuning in, listening, viewing, watching. Uh, especially for taking the time out of your week to have this conversation with me. Please like, rate, subscribe, review, all that sort of thing. Share the show. Let's continue to grow the show. Shout out to our new podcast host, Believe. Uh, it's great being out with their network, seeing all the different shows they're putting out. Uh, we're going to have to get some get some networking done within their podcast network and see if we can't get some soccer people to come on our show here and talk, especially in the off season, a little bit. But of course, as always, thank you for listening, our listeners, our viewers, and let's go fire.